Section 7 of Magna Carta Commemoration Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Casper. Per Eudicium Perium, Well Per Legum Terrae, by Professor F. M. Poica. In his recent treatise upon the origin of the English Constitution, Professor G. B. Adams has pushed to its logical conclusion what may be called the baronial tendency in current interpretations of the thirty-ninth clause of the Great Charter. The barons, he suggests, were thinking almost entirely, if not entirely, of themselves. They were demanding that they should not be imprisoned, disseized, or outlawed, except after a trial in the king's court, by the judgment of their peers, and by the whole body of law and custom which such judgments are intended to interpret and apply. By the king's court, the barons meant the magnates of the realm, not the judges alone. By the law of the land, they meant no particular form of procedure, certainly not the process of indictment and presentment, as I understand this view, the barons desired to place themselves beyond the scope of the judicial system elaborated in the reign of Henry the Second and Richard the First. They were thinking of such trials as those of William of St. Calais and St. Thomas of Canterbury. This view is clear and intelligible. It is a good starting point. Without traversing the whole field of speculation fully described in Mr. McKechnie's commentary, I wish to put over against Professor Adams's view the old fourteenth-century interpretation of the clause, and see what can be said for it. There appears to be no doubt that in the minds of politicians of Edward III's reign the clause comprehended all free men, and the law of the land covered all the due processes of law, even indictment and the appeal whether there was a judgment of peers or not depended on the circumstances. We can all agree that the barons were thinking mainly of their own safety, and were not thinking directly of trial by jury. But if we accept the Edwardian view, we cannot hold that the charter is simply the program of a pack of feudal reactionaries. According to Professor Adams, the barons were seeking to undermine, so far as it concerned them, the whole fabric of the new judicial system, including the jury, the itinerant justice court, and the permanent central court of common pleas. According to the fourteenth-century politicians, the barons frankly recognized the value of the judicial system, new and old, and in this clause were maintaining the rights of the subject against an arbitrary prerogative. The inquiry involves two separate but related questions. In the first place, assuming that the clause was intended to apply to the barons alone, was it only concerned with a trial by peers in the king's court? In the next place, ought we to limit the phrase liber homo to the barons? If the barons were not thinking of the ordinary freemen, they may nonetheless have been thinking of more than one judicial method, if they did include the ordinary free man in their demand, they would naturally allow a variety of procedure. 1. Nullus liber homo capiatur, well imprisonetur, aut disesiatur, aut ut lagetur, aut exuletur, aut aliquo modo destruetur, nec super eum ibimus, nec super eum mitemus, Nisi per legale judicium parium suorum, well per legem terrae. The barons and their followers were in this clause included among the liberae homines. Indeed, John's letters of 10th May 1215 show that the baronial desire for protection was perhaps the original motive of the clause. These letters, addressed a month before the date of the Charter, read as follows. Sciatis me concessise baronibus nostris qui contra nos sunt, 
quod nec eos nec homines suos capiemus nec disesiemus nec super eos per wim well per arma ibimus nisi per legem regni nostri well per judicium parium suorum in curia mea donec consideratio facta fuerit per tres quos elegemus ex parte nostra et per tres quos elegent ex parte sua et dominum papam qui superior erit super eos note the corresponding clause in the articles of the barons paragraph twenty nine reads ne corpus liberi hominis capiatur nec imprisonator nec disesiator end note it does not appear, however, that the king is promising a trial by peers in his court as a remedy in all cases. Even though by the baron's men only their more important followers were intended, John is not likely to have given an undertaking that all charges against them would be brought before the supreme authority. Nor do the words, Per legem regni, well per judicium parium, taken in their natural sense, suggest that the law of the realm and a judgment of peers are indissolubly connected, or, in this case, identical. Such a serious conclusion must be based upon a much stronger argument than the probable meaning of well. The word well is used about sixty times in Magna Carta, but never, so far as I can see, in an explanatory or accumulative sense. However vague or weak its disjunctive quality may be, it cannot suddenly be construed as et etiam or id est. As the author of the Dialogus de Scaccario points out, even et was frequently used at that time in a disjunctive sense, unless the meaning of the terms themselves suggests a much closer connection between the ideas of the lex regni and the judicium parium, the use of well can only suggest that they are not rigid alternatives. One would expect the king to mean that, without stating exactly the scope of the law of the realm, he would observe it. It might include a judgment of peers, or it might not, if the circumstances were peculiar, owing, for example, to the importance of the offender or the difficulty of the case, the judgment would not be arbitrary. The defendant's peers could be or would be called upon to see that justice was done. The practice of the time and the general meaning of the words used strengthen the probability of this interpretation. In many cases, a judgment of peers in the king's court was doubtless the normal method of procedure. A great baron's default of service, for example, might result in disseisin by such a judgment. But a judgment of peers was not the only legal way. During the sharp quarrel in 1205 between King John and William the Marshal, the Marshal offered to defend his fidelity against the most valiant man in the kingdom, by God's teeth, swore the king, that is nothing. I want the judgment of my barons. The marshal was ready to stand this test also, but the barons shrank from giving judgment. And when John of Bassingbourne, one of the king's bachelors, ventured to speak, the Count of Omal silenced him. It is not for you or me to judge a knight of the marshal's quality. There is no man here bold enough to put his default to the proof of the sword. Si hardi qui vers lui montra le forfait. The duel is distinguished in this scene from the Eudicium Parium. The barons regard the duel as the more appropriate test, while the king prefers the Eudicium. Note. Histoire de Guillaume le Maréchal, edited by Meyer, volume 2, pages 109 to 112. Four years earlier the king had acted in an exactly contrary way. The Poitevin barons asked for a judgment of peers. John had tried to insist upon a trial by combat against picked champions of his own. Howden, volume 4, page 176. End note. 
did the lex regni mean the old form of procedure, such as the feudal trial by combat? Procedure was certainly part of the law of the realm, and some scholars have wished to limit the meaning of the phrases lex regni, lex terrae, to this form of trial, excluding any wider sense, for example, process, and the methods of appeal and indictment which might precede the actual proof. I can see no reason for any such limitation in the thirty-ninth clause of the Great Charter. The Lex Terrae, which is substituted for John's Lex Regni, was certainly used of the ancient forms of proof, but in Norman and in Anglo-Norman law it was more frequently used in the sense of the general body of law operating through familiar processes. The word terra was used sometimes to denote a holding, as in the phrase terrae normanorum, but also to denote a district subject to public law, whether the local patria or the regnum as a whole. Its substitution for regnum in the clause under discussion shows that lex terrae was here intended to apply to the customs of England, and probably to cover also any varieties of local customs, such as those recognized by the justices in Kent and Herefordshire. And it may be noticed that the phrase lex terrae was commonly used of actions and procedure generally, for example, of the possessory assizes, a writ of right, and the proceedings in outlawry. The phrase judgment of peers, on the other hand, had a more limited and precise meaning. It implied a particular kind of court, a court of doomsmen. The judgment must be delivered on behalf of a company of men who were of the same race or nationality or status as that of the accused or party. It involved the equitable principle which underlay the recognition and the accusing jury, Indeed, the processes of inquiry and judgment met in the jury of arbitrators, of which we have an example in John's letters of May 1215. But the judgment of peers was not the same as, and did not include, the recognition and the presentment. The Jews in England claimed the judgment of their peers, but they objected to a mixed jury of recognitors. Note a comparison of John's charter to the Jews, Rotterly Cartarum, page 93, with a case in the year 1224 in Bracton's Notebook, volume 2, page 706, case 918, makes this clear. End note. A solemn trial in the Curia Regis, in the presence of the magnates of the realm, the ordinary session of the Shire Court, perhaps also the trial of possessory actions before justices, enforced by local knights, involved a judgment by peers. The proceedings before the justices on air did not, I think, involve this kind of judgment, but the lex terrae would be enforced in all alike. A contemporary change in Norman procedure illustrates very clearly the distinction between the lex terrae and the judicium parium. After the conquest of Normandy, King Philip Augustus took the trial of ducal pleas in the Bellywicks out of the hands of justices, and gave it to local men. The Custumal says, Assisie vero tenentur per barones et legales homines, pa per parem judicari debet. The procedure of the court, and the law enforced by the court, were not affected by the change. The lex terrae was observed both before and after, but henceforward a trial, according to law, would in Normandy involve a judicium parium. In England this was not necessarily the case. The phrase lex terrae, then, though not excluding a judgment of peers, suggests so many varieties of law and procedure, that a demand for a judgment of peers in every possible case could hardly be expressed in words so mild and general as per judicium parium well per legum terrae. I have pointed out that even a great baron accused of default 
did not regard the judgment of his peers as the most natural or obvious way of meeting the charge. Moreover, other clauses of the Charter indicate that the barons used more explicit language when they wished to emphasize a demand for a judicium parium. Disputes about land on the Welsh border were to be settled, per judicium parium secundum legum, in accordance with the law of England, Wales, or the March, as the case might be. Note. Magna Carta, Section 52, Sections 55, 56, and the Articles of the Barons, Section 25. The phrase, per judicium parium secundum legem, does not mean that judgment of peers is according to law, but that the judgment by peers must be in accordance with the law. Those writers who identify the phrase with the phrase per judicium parium well per legem terrae seem to have overlooked this distinction. End note. The conclusion is forced upon my mind, at least, that the thirty-ninth clause was intended to lay stress not so much on any particular form of trial as on the necessity for protection against the arbitrary acts of imprisonment, disseisin, and outlawry in which King John had indulged. If we turn to some leading cases of the next twenty years, a period during which the Great Charter was solemnly renewed, fresh in men's minds, and acknowledged as authoritative, this view is confirmed. There is the same insistence upon protection, the same concern for the observance of law, and also the same hesitation or indifference about the actual constitution of the court. The king acknowledges that he has disregarded the forms of law. It may be in his own court, or it may be in a shire court. Redress is given by the magnates of the realm, if the case is of great importance, or by a judge in the royal following. Maitland was fond of reminding us that the distinctions between the royal courts were but vaguely defined in the thirteenth century, and with similar indefiniteness we find coram rege cases decided now by the assembled magnates and now by a single justice. One such case concerned a great Yorkshire house. The desirable manor of Cottingham, which had been much improved, first by William, then by Nicholas de Stuteville, was claimed by Nicholas's co-heiresses on their father's death in 1233, but it had been for some weeks in the possession of his nephew Eustace, a man of some importance in the affairs of the shire. This was clearly a case for an assize of Mort d'Ancester and for a writ of right. For some reason the king intervened, dispossessed Eustace, installed the heiresses and their husbands, and finally, per concilium magnatum de curia sua, took the manor into his own hands. Eustace had offered large sums for a judgment, and in 1234, at Wallingford, on the octave of Trinity, 25th June, his claim was heard by William Raleigh. The king was present, and admitted that he had acted on his own initiative in deceasing Eustace without due process of law. Sine summonitione et sine judicio. Eustace was ready again with his offer of one thousand pounds, the fine was accepted, and judgment was given that he should be reinstated, pending a settlement of Assize of Mort d'Ancester and Writ of Right, Secundum Legem Terrae. Eustace de Stuteville seems to have come to an arrangement with Hugh Wake, one of his rivals, and was clearly doubtful of his claim. But the king had deceased him without a judgment, and the decision at Wallingford points to the legal process by Assize and Writ, to a possessory and proprietary action, as the means of summons and judgment. A thousand pounds was a large sum, yet a royal admission of error in the royal court was perhaps worth the money. The case appears on a roll of pleas which followed the king before W. de Raleigh. Eustace was apparently restored not by Eudicium parium, but by one of the king's judges. The other claimants were deceased by an administrative act of their peers, but in Eustace's history there is no mention of such a judgment. Stress is laid not on it, but on summons, judgment, 
Assize of Mort Dancester, Writ of Right, The Law of the Land. A more famous trial of the same year illustrates the proceedings per legem terrae in the case of outlawry. The decrees of outlawry declared by King Henry against the great Hubert de Burg and also against Gilbert Bassett and other companions of Richard Earl Marshall were annulled by a judgment of their peers, declared by the mouth of the same William Raleigh who decided the Cottingham case. The king, says the record, desired to show justice, and on 23rd May, 1234, called together all the magnates then present in his court at Gloucester, including Edmund, Archbishop of Canterbury, bishops, earls, and others. This judgment ended the political crisis, during which the Earl Marshal, before his violent death in Ireland, and Gilbert Bassett, had made the claim to be tried by their peers, and had been met by Peter de Roche with the well-known retort, There are no peers in England. One would expect, therefore, a deliverance by the court at Gloucester on the question as to whether a baron could be outlawed without a judgment of his peers. But the judgment contains nothing of the kind. It reverses the decree of outlawry in Gilbert Bassett's case, one, because the act which provoked the king, the rescue, namely, of Hubert de Burg from sanctuary at Devizes, was done in the course of war, a cajene gurai, and was not therefore an ordinary criminal offence. Two, because the proceedings of outlawry in the Shire Court of Wiltshire were irregular, and only in the third place, three, because Gilbert and his friends had been prepared to stand their trial in the King's Court. The decree against Hubert de Bourg was annulled on the ground that escape from prison was not in itself punishable by outlawry, in both cases, stress is laid on the proceedings in the Shire Court, that is to say, on the Lex Terrae. Note. The phrase is explicitly used in another outlawry case, Notebook, Volume 2, page 75, case 85, of the year 1220. Certain persons who had refused to answer a writ, and whose guilt was clear, were condemned, if they continued to resist the royal officials, to be outlawed in comitatu secundum legum terre. End note. The magnates clearly imply that these barons, distinguished though they were, could have been lawfully outlawed if they had fled. Per appellum racionabile, aut per sectam domini regis, ubi fama patriae accusaret. Bracton, as Maitland points out, probably had this judgment in mind when he stated that outlawry at the king's suit or command is a nullity unless an inquest has been taken by the justices and the fugitive has been found guilty. Elsewhere, Maitland describes the judgment in Hubert's case as an important step in constitutional history, since it made indictment or appeal a necessary preliminary to outlawry. But was not the court simply enforcing the principle laid down in the Great Charter? Was it not interpreting the principle to mean that the lex terrae in a case of outlawry was the process in the Shire Court involving either the indictment or the appeal? 2. I have suggested that the barons did not claim a judgment of peers as an essential and universal remedy even for themselves. Their words do not imply this claim, and actual practice did not enforce it. The lex terrae might be trial by combat, as in the Marshal's case in 1205, or proceedings in a possessory action, as in Eustace de Stuteville's case, or indictment or appeal, as in the case of Gilbert Bassett and Hubert de Bourg. It did not involve a judicium parium. That was either an alternative or a last resort a solution of a judicial or political deadlock. But it is not clear that the barons were thinking only of themselves. Indeed, the conviction that this clause asserts a claim to the judgment of peers in all cases has, I think, been father to the thought that the words liber homo do not include the ordinary free man. Students of the Charter have felt that a claim to the judgment of his peers by the ordinary freeman was either unnecessary or absurd. 
They have urged also that the barons had no special interest in the judicial rights of the ordinary free man, and in the manner of King Charles I liked to speak of themselves as free men. The substitution of the words liber homo in the thirty-ninth clause for the baroness et homines sui of King John's letters had no special significance. First, let us look at the use of the words in the charter. The freeman appears six times. In the fifteenth clause he is protected against unlawful and unreasonable aids levied by his lord. In the twenty-first, against immersements which might shatter his social position. In the thirtieth, against forced contributions of horses and wagons for carrying purposes. In the thirty-fourth, against the loss of his court by a writ praecipe in the thirty-ninth against arbitrary imprisonment, etc., and in the twenty-seventh clause regulations are laid down for the distribution of his chattels if he should die intestate. If we set aside the thirty-fourth and thirty-ninth clauses for the moment, the charter clearly safeguards the ordinary freeman. Limits are set to the power of his lord. Local officials are to respect his freedom. Judges are to permit his neighbors to immerse him fairly. His relatives are not to suffer when he commits that last sin of intestacy. In two of these clauses the ordinary freeman is explicitly distinguished from the baron. In the twenty-seventh and thirtieth he is primarily intended. Is it credible that in the thirty-fourth and thirty-ninth clauses the same phrase, liber homo, can exclude him? Note. The only argument in favor of exclusion is that in the thirty-fourth clause, where the freeman's court is protected against the writ praecipe, only a baron's court could be intended, but could not any manorial court suffer through the writ? End note. Recent exponents of the charter have not, I think, allowed sufficient weight to the fact that the document was not a baronial manifesto, but a carefully drafted statement of a settlement, in which churchmen, citizens, and statesmen who had large experience of public affairs took part. Archbishop Langton and several of the barons on each side were not likely to overlook the growing significance of the freeman in English society, or the danger which the community of the realm would run if his economic and legal position were not protected. By the close of the twelfth century, the freeholder was an important element in every feudal state of civilized Europe. In most countries it is probable that he did little more than represent a general economic tendency towards fixed services and money rents, and that affranchisement was a privilege of more or less sentimental value, not affecting the actual position of a serf. In England the freeman, however slightly his economic status might differ from that of the villain, was becoming essential to the state, as the state was more and more defined in laws and institutions. Within the economy of the manor, the freeman, or to speak more accurately, the free tenant, strengthened the wealth and dignity of the lord. On the one hand, enfranchised villains were founding families, on the other hand, as the Doomsday Book of St. Paul's records, old tenements were frequently resettled, or new tenements divided, among free tenants paying fixed rents. Note. The Doomsday of St. Paul's, Camden Society, Passim, the free tenants, tenants ad sensum, tenants at a rent of new essarts divided by the farmers of the manors, for example, pages 12 and 36, are as numerous as the other tenants. A forester, a smith, a merchant, and a templar's relicta were among the tenants of the Essart at Wickham. Page 37. End note. It was to the common interest that these men should not be broken, and the thirty-ninth clause of the charter, in protecting them and their tenements against illegal interference from the king and his officials, in my opinion, simply applied the general principle expressed in other clauses. We have seen that in the case of outlawry, the lex terrae required a charge, either by indictment or appeal in the shire court. There is some evidence for the view 
that the thirty-ninth clause met in addition the desire of the free man for protection against administrative proceedings at the king's command and especially against imprisonment without the prospect of a trial in the local court the contest between the principles of order and liberty had already begun the natural instrument of order was the prison during a political crisis or an epidemic of criminal unrest it was convenient to issue commands for a summary inquiry and for the imprisonment of suspected persons during his majesty's pleasure the well-known edictum regium of eleven ninety five preserved in the chronicle of roger of howden was in fact a command of this sort a crimes act disregarding the usual procedure during king richard's absence in the holy land the country had been much disturbed and hubert walter the new justiciar was determined to restore order the great inquiry of eleven ninety four did not meet the situation the justices had probably been too busy to get through the ordinary police business indeed roger of howden tells us that a very important inquiry into the administration of sheriffs and local officials was postponed hence in eleven ninety five knights were appointed to deal with crime a sworn obligation was imposed upon all males of fifteen years and upwards the inhabitants of each district balia swore that they would keep the king's peace join in the hue and cry deliver all who were guilty or suspected of robbery and theft to the knights appointed the knights passed on the malefactors to the sheriff who was not to release them save at the command of the king or justiciar non deliberandos nisi per regem aut eius capitalem justitiam the duty prescribed to the king's subjects was very similar to that which they performed in the hundred court but the procedure was different the presentments were received by special commissioners and the imprisonment of those presented followed as a matter of course per sacramentum fidelium hominum devis nato says roger of howden multos caperunt et carceribus regis inclusarunt no mention is made of judgment in the shire court before the justices the trustworthy men were not the jury of presentment and the accused had no opportunity of alleging their general good character and of submitting to the proof it is probable that the ordinary methods of attaching and trying criminals had broken down they broke down periodically during the middle ages but they were quite definite and must have been well understood suspected persons were arrested by the sheriff and his bailiffs sometimes by the tithing man or in the hue and cry they might be locked up in the king's jail or entrusted to the custody of the tithing or they might be handed over to their relatives or pledges who would be made responsible for their appearance they were presented whether in captivity or not at the sheriff's turn and again at the shire court before the justices on air if they were of bad repute and had been arrested in the act they might be punished according to the discretion of the court without further inquiry that is to say without going to the ordeal or other proof yet even in such a case the assize of clarendon admitted the right of the accused to find a warranty si non habeat warentum non habeat legem other suspected persons those for example of decent repute who had been found in possession of stolen goods went to the ordeal and after the abolition of the ordeal were given the opportunity of placing themselves super patriam of standing by the verdict of a jury in all this process imprisonment was merely an incidental affair it was not yet a common form of punishment after conviction and only gradually became so general as a form of detention as to necessitate commissions of jail delivery the distinction between the normal procedure and the drastic action taken by hubert walter in eleven ninety five was to be of the greatest importance in future history was it realized at the time at first sight the answer seems to be decidedly in the negative it is not likely that any opposition was made to the particular edict of eleven ninety five 
the royal duty of good government included the maintenance of the public peace. These malefactors were persons of ill fame, and were arrested after sworn inquiry among their neighbors. Whether they were tried or not in the future would be a matter of general indifference, and could be left to the royal discretion. Moreover, the king was the source of justice. The man committed to jail, per mandatum domine regis, would in the twelfth and thirteenth centuries have found none to liberate him. By Bracton's time, a sheriff who released on main prize a man who had been arrested by the king's command, or on command of the justiciar, would have defied the law of England. And although this rule, it is true, applied to prisoners awaiting trial, there was nothing to compel the king to bring them to trial. It must be admitted that administrative action such as Hubert Walter's was regarded as within the lawful scope of authority, also that persons imprisoned by the king's command could, before the law of habeas corpus had been painfully hammered out, be tried at the king's pleasure. The Edictum Regium of 1195 is the first of a long series of formal acts enforcing what may be termed the administrative law of the prerogative a prerogative which still exists in king and parliament. Yet I believe that even at the close of the twelfth century, the desire to emphasize the extraordinary nature of this reserved power was both felt and expressed. This desire is expressed, I think, in the thirty-ninth clause of the Great Charter. The Charter did not succeed in abolishing the prerogative right of imprisonment, it was more successful in stretching the protection of the law over the free tenement, but it did assert the principle that the free man must normally be accused and punished in a special manner, however awkward or inefficient that manner might be. From the days of Henry the Second, the two methods of keeping the king's peace, the one per legem terrae, the other by administrative action, may be traced in medieval England. 1. It is clear that Henry the Second anticipated the action of Hubert Walter, probably with much less formality. The proof is to be found in the action of Queen Eleanor after Henry's death in 1189. She sent commissioners through England to liberate prisoners. The orders given to these commissioners carefully distinguished various kinds of persons who were in jail. Offenders against the forest law were to be set free and pardoned. Persons imprisoned per commune rectum were to find pledge for their appearance, in case an appeal should be brought against them. If they could find no pledge, they were to be sworn to appear. Various other classes who had been subject to legal process were also enumerated. They were in most cases to be released under conditions. But one group was, like the offenders against forest law, to be freed unconditionally. Et ut omnes alii qui capti essent et retenti per voluntatem regis vel justitiae eius, qui non essent retenti per commune rectum, comitatus vel hundredi vel per appellationem quieti essent. Clearly, in 1189 the king's prisons contained persons who had been imprisoned by decree, not in accordance with the procedure defined in the assizes of Clarendon and Northampton. Unimportant people who should have been presented at the hundred court had not escaped Henry's attention. However salutary this direct intervention may have been, it was felt to be anomalous. In order to show that a new reign had begun, the Queen Mother declared an act of grace. 2. Two years later, restrictions were imposed by the barons on the justiciar's power of administrative decision. The critics of William Longchamp admitted the right of the king to decease a vassal of his property without a rigid observance of the new procedure. But as a rule, the lawful customs and assizes of the kingdom must be observed. Sed et concessum est quod episcopi et abates, comites et barones, Wawasores et liberi tenentes, known ad voluntatem justitiarum vel ministrorum domini regis, de terris vel catalis suis disesientur, 
sed judicio curiae domini regis secundum legitimas consuetudines et assisas regni tracta buntur well per mandatum domini regis two points are noticeable in this passage the free tenant who is distinguished from the baron and vavasor was explicitly included and protection was particularly desired from the royal officials the demand was extended in 1215 to protection against the king and was defined still more clearly in 1217 in a passage which recalls the wording of this treaty nullus liber homo decesietur de libero tenemento suo well libertatibus well liberis consuetudinibus suis nisi per legale judicium parium suorum well per legem terrae three decision was more easily dealt with than imprisonment we have seen that between eleven eighty nine and twelve fifteen hubert walter systematized the practice of imprisonment per mandatum regis and forbade release nisi per regem aut eius capitalem justitiam in john's reign this practice recognized as anomalous in eleven eighty nine became a nuisance john was for one thing not concerned to take the opinion of his victim's neighbors into consideration he was after booty not justice he spared neither small nor great and he was compelled to surrender this prerogative in twelve fifteen as mr mckechnie has reminded us later opponents of the jurisdiction of the king's council interpreted the thirty-ninth clause of the charter in this way they insisted upon the necessity of indictment or presentment by good and lawful people of the neighborhood in which the crime was committed coke borrowed the same construction from edward the Third's statutes when he translated per legem terrae by the words due process of law the phrase indeed is a very fair equivalent to queen eleanor's per commune rectum comitatus well hundredi well per appellationem on this view the clause comprehended the criminal procedure of the twelfth century it said in effect unless the case is so anomalous or the accused so important that a trial in the king's court by the magnates of the realm is desirable he must be dealt with in the usual way by presentment or indictment in hundred or shire courts with recourse to the customary proofs note neither baron nor freeman got matters all his own way in the thirteenth century we have state prisoners who did not find much help in magna carta End note. in twelve forty one the sheriffs were instructed by henry the third to keep suspected persons in prisone nostra donec a nobis aliud haburis mandatum in twelve sixty four simon de montfort went further than hubert walter had gone in eleven ninety five in the king's name he placed every shire under a single custos pacis who was instructed to use the whole strength of the shire for the arrest of criminals and disturbers of the peace the arrested persons were to be kept in custody Donec aliud inde praeceperimus. But Simon's action was taken under very abnormal conditions. On the whole, the principles laid down in the charter were observed with remarkable continuity. I have already pointed out how Henry the Third was obliged in 1234 to reverse an unlawful decision and the unlawful outlawry of certain barons. The freeman was also protected the royal officials for example had reason to be very prudent and circumspect in their dealing with suspected persons a rash imprisonment might involve them in heavy damages note notebook volume two page three sixty six five forty two cases four sixty five seven o five in the latter case a sheriff was declared in misericordiam for wrongful imprisonment even though the sheriff said that if murder had been committed the accused were the guilty persons End note. the periodic revival of disorder in fact was encouraged by the conditions which made officials and communities alike unwilling to prosecute their duties 
a false step was so expensive. The government tried to deal with disorder by reforms in the police organization, but did not, except on rare occasions, as in 1241 and 1264, interfere with procedure. The police reforms were no more an infringement of the Charter than was the growth in the practice of imprisonment pending trial, or the rule that a man so imprisoned by the king's command could not be replieved. Yet these reforms have probably been confused with the occasional edicts interfering with the lex terrae, although in reality they maintained continuity in procedure. The thirteenth-century conservators of the peace, whether they were sergeants elected by the shire, or knights appointed by the king, or important barons invested with special powers, were concerned mainly with the visum armorum and the process of arrest. Just as the head boroughs and constables kept the peace in township and manor, so the conservators assisted the execution of the common law in hundred and shire. The elaborate writ of 1242, which assigned knights in each shire, refers explicitly to the subsequent trial of suspected persons, per legum terrae, thus correcting the action taken in the previous year, Suspectos autem de die per quoscumque arrestatos recipiant vice comites sine dilacione et difficultate et salvo custodiant, donec per legem terrae deliberentur. One of the objects of the Statute of Winchester, which codified previous legislation in 1285, was the more conscientious and exhaustive presentment of malefactors by the local juries. The conservators were gradually given judicial functions, and developed into the justices of the peace, but they still administered the common law, the lex terrae. Hence, when Stubbs traced a connection between Hubert Walter's Milites Assignati, Earl Simon's Custos Pacis, and the justice of the peace, he was, I venture to think, suggesting a misleading confusion between the exceptional and the normal in the history of criminal law. So far as their police duties were concerned, the connection between these officials is clear, but it is easy to forget that whereas the justice of the peace had behind him the assizes of arms and Clarendon, the officials appointed in 1195 and 1264 had not. The peculiarity of the measures taken in 1195 and 1264 lay not in the method of arrest, but in the imprisonment during the king's pleasure. The commissions issued to the justices of the peace, on the contrary, from the period when they combined the functions of conservators and justices, until the year 1590, directed the enforcement of the Statute of Winchester, that is to say, of the final definition of the system laid down in the assizes of arms, Clarendon, and Northampton. The justices were so circumscribed by the lex terrae, that in the fifteenth and sixteenth centuries, they could not order an arrest until the accused had been indicted in open sessions of the peace. In Edward III's reign the practice was more elastic, but well within the limits of the traditional system. According to the Commission of 1357, the justices were to arrest, after inquiry, per sacramentum proborum et legalium hominum, and to determine the cases, secundum legem et consuetudinem regni nostri angliae. The statute of 1360 ordered them to pursue, arrest, and punish evildoers, selon la loi et coutume du royaume. The lex terrae constantly broke down in the time of justices of the peace, as it had constantly broken down in hundred and shire, the difficulties are clearly described in the Statute of Winchester, and in the petitions to the judges on air, to counsel, to the Chancellor, and to the Parliament. The folk of the district would not present, officials grew slack and corrupt. The justices in their turn were too often either overworked or open to unjust influences. In the twelfth and thirteenth centuries the King's ministers or council tried to remedy matters, by decrees for laying criminals by the heels. In the fourteenth, the council began to hear and determine petitions on its own account, 
began in short to lay the foundation of that judicial control which was later to develop into the courts of star chamber and requests it was under these new circumstances that parliament appealing to the great charter raised its voice on behalf of the lex terrae the system of indictment and presentment the party of law not for the last time in our history was not the party of order even though it was the party of progress in the fourteenth century the important phrase was lex terrae in the seventeenth the party of law and progress fastened on the phrase judicium parium in this paper i have tried to show that however badly the contemporaries of pym and selden may have blundered there is a good deal to be said for their fourteenth century predecessors in twelve fifteen neither baron nor freeman was concerned primarily with a judgment of peers so much as with justice the judici imparium ran through a good part of english procedure but it was not universal from the baronial standpoint it was especially important as a last resort in cases where justice had not been done and the law was uncertain the barons had no intention of excluding from the lex terrae any part of the new judicial system neither the court of common pleas nor the justices in error nor the presentment of the grand jury they were demanding as they demanded at merton a few years later that the practices of english law should not be changed in the same spirit they desired that sheriffs and other local officials should be men acquainted with the lex regni and on the whole they got their way the peculiarity of english history is not that the common law is supreme but that it is so practised as to seem supreme and that other expressions of the sovereign power whether the equitable jurisdiction of the king's council in the fourteenth century or a defence of the realm act in the twentieth are universally admitted to be temporary and abnormal if king john had not grossly abused his power as the source of justice it is quite possible that this tradition would never have been formed the policy of efficiency practised by men like hubert walter thomas cromwell and francis bacon might well have gathered momentum and swept aside the prejudices in favour of the common law End of section seven.